so as you said, my topic are the plasma cytodendritic cells um, and their function in the immune system. And you can see one such cell here. Um, and you can see the beautiful dendrite it forms when it's activated. And actually this gives it a huge cell surface for interaction with other immune cells. So uh, let me first introduce the classical dendritic cell. And uh, this is sort of the dogma how dendritic cells work. And now we know more about this type of cell and we know that it's not always like this. But let me go through this first. So dendritic cells sit in the peripheral tissues in an immature state where they are um, picking up antigens from their surroundings, self-antigens or foreign antigens. And these cells are equipped with uh, different types of pattern recognition receptors which can recognize uh, pathogenic molecules, molecules from pathogens such as viruses or bacteria. And uh, this way the cells can be stimulated. <clears throat> Dendritic cells then undergo a process called maturation and they also migrate and carry antigen through lymphatic vessels to the um, draining lymph node. Uh, during this, uh, antigens are processed and loaded onto MHC class 1 and MHC class 2 molecules and upon stimulation, co-stimulatory molecules such as CD80, CD86, and also CD40 are upregulated, and cytokine and chemokine production is induced. Um, and in the T cell area where these uh, dendritic cells go, they interact with naive CD4 and CD8 T cells, which are stimulated through the T cell receptor, through co-stimulatory molecules, and which also receive um, a stimulus by cytokines and chemokines released by the dendritic cells. This leads to clonal T cell expansion and differentiation into effector cells, T helper cells, as well as cytotoxic uh, T cells. <coughs> um, we can differentiate in principle between two types of dendritic cells, the conventional dendritic cells, which resemble the ones I have just uh, explained to you, and the plasma cytodendritic cells, which are quite different. <coughs> And actually, um, from now on, all uh, the experiments were done in mice, so I will now introduce uh, the dendritic cell subpopulations in this experimental model. And there are also similar types of dendritic cells in the human. So in spleen and lymph nodes, we find different types of conventional dendritic cells. And these are, for example, the CD8 alpha positive and CD11 B negative uh, conventional DCs and a subgroup of CD11B positive, CD8 negative dendritic cells, which come in two flavors, uh, ESAM low and ESAM high. And of course, we also find plasma cytodendritic cells, which initially in their not activated state uh, do not even look like dendritic cells. They rather resemble um, plasma cells in their morphology. In non-lymphoid tissues, equivalents of these splenic dendritic cells exist expressing uh, different markers in, in the periphery. For example, the equivalent of the CD8 alpha positive are the CD103 positive, CD11B negative cells. And um, in the periphery, we find an additional population of cells expressing CD11B and the chemokine receptor CX3CR1, fractokine receptor. And these cells are actually related to the macrophage monocyte lineage and they are greatly expanded upon inflammation and produce inflammatory cytokines. These are called inflammatory DCs. The plasma cytoid DCs are characterized by expression of a B cell marker, B220, and in the mouse, the, these cells express two specific molecules which are only expressed on PDCs, and these are BST2 and cyclic H. I will come to that later. Now, it's not only an academic exercise to differentiate all these different uh, populations of DCs, but actually it has been shown recently that they really differ in function. And um, to, for an example, the CD8 alpha positive or CD103 positive uh, dendritic cell subset is specialized for CD8 T cell priming and especially efficient in inducing cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Whereas the CD11B positive populations 
are more efficient in CD4 T cell priming and are required for TH1 and TH17 induction. Um, and I also already alluded to this, uh, the inflammatory disease of course produce uh, large amounts of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as TNF, IL-6, IL-12, IL-23 and also participate in TH1, TH17 induction during inflammation. <coughs> um, referring to the plasma cytoid dendritic cells, the picture was less clear until recently when mice were studied where you can actually deplete uh, plasma cytoid disease efficiently. And in these mouse models, it was shown that actually the PDCs are also important for the CD8 T cell response uh, against viruses and bacteria. They are also involved in the homeostasis of regulatory T cells, both in the thymus and in the periphery. Uh, they are involved in oral tolerance and in mucosal IgA production, so interaction with B cells. And one of the hallmarks of these cells is their production of huge amounts of type 1 interferon upon viral infection or uh, other stimulations. <clears throat> we and others have uh, extensively characterized this cell type and have found that viral DNA and RNA as well as bacterial DNA um, or even self-DNA and RNA within autoimmune complexes can stimulate PDCs through toll-like receptors 7 and 9. Uh, leading to activation and the induction of um, type 1 interferons and other cytokines and chemokines. So um, the main focus of the field was first on their secretory function. And this actually does play a role in the innate antiviral response. Um, subsequently, their function for adaptive immunity has been studied and it's now clear that they play a role uh, in the adaptive antiviral and antibacterial immunity through induction of T cell responses and also B cell responses. In addition, PDCs have a role for immune regulation and the control of inflammation. And um, they use Treg dependent and Treg independent pathways to achieve this immune control. So PDCs are involved in antimicrobial defense, <coughs> in immune homeostasis, and also can be involved in autoimmune disease development, especially in the case of diseases where type 1 interferons play a role in the pathogenesis, such as systemic lupus erythematosus or the viscot alvey syndrome, as Francesca has shown. <coughs> So in the first part of my data presentation, I would like to show you our results on antigen targeting to plasma cytodendritic cells in vivo and the effect on um, the immune responses, uh, which can be either tolerogenic or immunogenic. This is work by a former PhD student in my lab, Jakob Loschko, who re recently started his postdoc in Michel Nussenzweig's lab in New York. And what he uh, did was antigen targeting using recombinant antibodies fused with model antigens. So this technique has already been studied um, using conventional dendritic cells and their um, CD8 alpha positive conventional DC were targeted using antibody against DEC205 fused to, for example, ovalbumin or other model antigens. And uh, in for CD8 alpha negative uh, conventional disease, anti DCR2, a C type lectin um, directed antibody, was used. And, and using this technique, uh, the function of these two subtypes for antigen presentation could be elucidated, and it was confirmed and shown that the CD8 alpha positive DC are efficient cross presenters to CD8 T cells, whereas the CD8 alpha negative are more. Um, efficient in T helper cell responses. For PDCs, this has not been extensively studied until now, and therefore we went ahead to construct uh, antibodies, recombinant antibodies against BST2 and cyclic H, two molecules expressed on murine PDCs, and these were fused to um, different model antigens. <coughs> So what are these molecules? Cyclic H is the sialic acid binding immunoglobulin-like lectin H, which is specifically expressed on murine PDCs. It can signal through DAP12 as an adapter, and it's known that cross-linking using a, a red monoclonal antibody against cyclic H can inhibit TLA9-induced type 1 interferon secretion. 
Um, the ligand of this receptor is unknown. It's just known that it's a C-type lectin, but it does not bind sugar, and it's not clear what the natural ligand is at present. BST2 um, is bone marrow stromal cell antigen 2, also called tetherin or CD317, and it's also called PDCA1. And this molecule is also specifically expressed in murine PDCs in the steady state. However, it is upregulated also on some other cell types um, by type 1 interference signaling. And it's known to modulate type 1 interference secretion. It inhibits the release of retroviruses, and that's where the name tethering comes from. Again, its ligand is unknown. In human cells, ILT7 appears to interact with BST2. So these were the two molecules we uh, targeted using antibodies. And the initial experiment we did was to look for the specificity of antigen presentation after injection of these antibodies fused to uh, an antigen called HEN-EG lysozyme. So this was a peptide from HEN-EG lysozyme fused to either anti-cyclic H or anti-BST2. We injected these antibodies systemically, IP, and then we looked at plasma cytoidendritic cells, uh, shown here as BST2 positive, CD11 C positive cells, at conventional dendritic cells, which are BST2 negative, uh, CD11 C high, <laughs> and all the re uh, remaining non-plasma cytoid DC in the spleen. And 16 hours after injection, we stained with an antibody which specifically uh, detects um, HEL peptide MHC class 2 complexes on the surface of antigen presenting cells. And we found that only pl in plasma cytoid DCs, these complexes were present on the surface um, with, for both antibodies. Whereas in conventional DCs and other cells from the spleen, we found no complexes on the surface. This was also the case at uh, earlier and later time points, and the specificity was maintained with simultaneous um, adjuvant stimulation using either TLR9 ligand, CPG, or a TLR3 and the A5 ligand, poly-IC. Um, we then compared the duration of the antigenic signal after one systemic injection of the antibody, and we found great differences between those two antibodies. So for anti-cyclic age um, HEL antibody, uh, we found a quite weak, um, uh, uh, quite low density of peptide MHC complexes, and this was present for up to seven days after only one injection. In contrast with anti-BST2 HEL, we found early on quite a strong uh, antigenic signal, but this was um, then rapidly lost, and uh, there was no, no detection of peptide MHC anymore after three days. Uh, the injection of these, these two antibodies, which actually have a murine IgG, um, uh, murine IgG uh, and do not bind to FC receptors, did not influence the expression of co-stimulatory molecules or the cytokine production in vitro or in vivo on PDCs and also conventional DCs. So we did not find any modulation of these uh, molecules. Um, now, we speculated that this difference in um, antigen presentation with the two uh, different targeting techniques would also lead to a difference in the immune responses, which we can elicit in vivo. To test this uh, hypothesis, we immunized black six mice with soluble ovalumin as antigen and poly-IC as adjuvant. And then we also used anticyclic um, H over or anti BST2 over together with poly IC as adjuvant and measured anti over antibody titers after two weeks in the serum. And you can see with the control stimulation uh, over poly IC, we get nice antibody titers. And with anti BST2 over poly IC, we get even higher antibody titers, especially for IgG2B and IgG2C, reflecting a Th1 biased immune response. With anti-cyclic age over plus poly-IC, however, we did not get any antibody responses. So we wondered, is this just a failure of inducing immune responses due to the low antigenic signal, or is there actually in, uh, inhibition of Im immunity going on? To test this, we simultaneously immunized with soluble over poly-IC and anti-cyclic age over, and again looked an, at anti-over antibody titers. And we found that the response to soluble over 
was greatly reduced when the mice were treated simultaneously with this targeting antibody. <clears throat> so that there is actually inhibition of immunity going on. So with anti cyclic age, we have a first a failure to induce effective immune response, and we have an inhibition of the immune response to soluble antigen. With anti-BST2, we can induce immunity, and we have shown that we can actually induce protective immunity against a viral challenge or even against a tumor challenge. And I will not go into more details uh, on this side of the story, but rather focus on the immune inhibition which we observe with anti-cyclic age, uh, with cyclic age targeting. <clears throat> so our first idea was that um, this targeting method might actually lead to de novo induction of regulatory Tregs over specific Tregs by the PDCs. And to test this idea, we um, isolated uh, naive T cells from DO1110 mice, which were on a RAC background, meaning that these were truly naive T cells lacking FOXP3 expression. FOXP3 is a marker of regulatory T cells. So these definitely did not express FOXP3 initially. They were transferred into the uh, wild-type mice, in this case on the bulb C um, strain, and then received an injection of anti-cyclic age over one day later. We then looked at these uh, T cells, which were detected using a specific antibody against the T cell receptor after four days, and we measured proliferation, shown by CFSE dilution, and also FOXP3 expression reflecting the frequency of Tregs. As a control, we used isotype uh, control antibody fused with OVA, and we saw no proliferation and no induction of FOXP3. Uh, as a positive control, we used the anti-DEC205 OVA antibody, and there, as expected, we could induce de novo uh, FOXP3 positive regulatory T cells between six and eight percent at this time point, and also uh, the T cells proliferated. Then we tested anti-cyclic age OVA in different concentrations. We found that we can induce proliferation of naive T cells, so an immune response is induced, but we don't see significant induction of regulatory T cells from these naive T cells. So this um, antigen targeting to PDCs that does not induce de novo uh, production of Tregs. We then wanted to see if um, the T cell response is influenced by uh, this antigen targeting. And to test that, we again transferred T cells uh, from DO1110 RAG knockout mice and then immunized with soluble OVA. And these mice received either simultaneously or two days before or eight or 15 days before um, the OVA uh, stimulus, the anti-cyclic age OVA immunization. And again, we looked at the T cells four days later and we found that um, this is the response in mice which had only received OVA. So here you see nice proliferation. And uh, we found that when anti-cyclic age was administered at the same time or two days earlier, we get a delay of the uh, proliferative response and less uh, expansion of the CD4 T cells. This was not the case when this antibody was injected at earlier times, again showing that this cannot be mediated by Tregs, which should also be present um, when this is applied earlier. <clears throat> um, to test the endogenous T helper cell responses, the influence of this uh, targeting on the endogenous T helper cell responses, we again immunized black 6 mice, this time subcutaneously with ovapeptide in complete Freund's adjuvant, a very strong stimulus. And this time we also included pertussis toxin to uh, enhance Th1 and Th17 responses. These mice received uh, anti-cyclic age over uh, one day earlier. And T cell responses were uh, measured in the spleen um, after in vitro re-stimulation with ovapeptide after 10 days. And you can see here, that um, the T cells produce nicely IL-2, IL-17, and interferon gamma, but no IL-4 or IL-10 with this immunization. And in the mice which had been pretreated with anti-cyclic age over, this response was greatly reduced, and there was no shift to IL-10 or IL-4 producing T cells. 
showing that TH1 and TH17 responses are attenuated. This was uh, repeatedly confirmed, and you can see that there is a significant reduction in TH1 and TH17 uh, responses. And we also uh, did re-stimulation with different doses of peptide and measured proliferation, and T cell proliferation was also reduced upon re-stimulation. Um, to evaluate if this uh, antigen targeting can be used to um, reduce a T helper cell dependent autoimmune response, we used the model of experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis induced by mock peptide, myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein peptide. In this case, mice are again immunized using this protocol with mock peptide, complete Freund's adjuvant, and pertussis toxin. And um, then the disease develops and can be measured using a clinical score. We treated these mice either with anticyclic H mock, so uh, containing the relevant autoantigen, or with a uh, anticyclic H antibody fused to OVA, which is an irrelevant antigen in this context as a control. You can see here mice without treatment get sick after 10 days, and peak of disease is reached after uh, day 15, 16, and then some of the mice uh, actually improve later on, but they do not fully recover. Um, the control antibody did not change this uh, clinical course uh, greatly, but with the anticyclic H PMOC uh, pretreatment, so only one injection, we do get um, reduced disease activity and delayed onset of disease. This correlated with a lower number of CD4 T cells in the CNS and also lower number of IL-2 in from gamma, IL-17 producing T helper cells in the brain and also of the percentage and number of IL-17 and from gamma double producing T cells which play an important pathogenic role in this disease. For T regulatory T cells, we found no significant change in um, the, the numbers and also no significant change in the percentage. But we wanted to look further into this matter if what happens to the T regs. And therefore, we transferred um, mock specific T cells expressing uh, TCR specific for this peptide, the 2D2 cells. And <clears throat> we um, analyzed the, percent, the proliferation and the percentage of FOXP3 positive T cells in the draining lymph nodes 10 days after this um, immunization. And we used anticyclic H over as a control antibody or anticyclic H uh, PMOG. And you can see here that the uh, percentage of Tregs was unchanged. So there was no induction of regulatory Tregs during the priming phase um, with this uh, treatment. And again, here the, the, there was no significant difference. But we do see, as expected, the delayed uh, proliferative response. Um, to investigate further if also autoreactive B cell responses are attenuated in this setting, we induced EAE using the full mock protein. And in this case, again, you can see the clinical course, uh, which was attenuated by anticyclic H PMOC treatment. And this correlated with much lower um, anti mock antibody titers uh, in these mice. So we conclude that antigen delivery to plasma cytoid disease via cyclic H actually inhibits um, central nervous system autoimmunity by reducing autoreactive TH1, TH helper cell responses and by reducing uh, autoantibody responses. And these, uh, this appears to occur in a Treg independent manner. So with anti-cyclic H antibody, we get a long-lasting antigen presentation at low levels on PDCs, and we attenuate antigen-specific immune responses and in a Treg independent fashion inhibit T helper cell and B cell mediated autoimmunity. With anti-BST2 um, antibody, BST2 targeting, we get a short-lived um, strong antigen stimulation, um, with, which leads to activation of antigen-specific effector T cells and provides protective immunity against viral challenge or uh, tumor growth. So we think that with using antigen delivery to this subtype of dendritic cells, 
can be designed to inhibit or to induce antigen-specific immunity. And it greatly depends on the molecule which you actually target using your antibodies. <coughs> With this, I'll come to the second part of my presentation, <coughs> which um, shows work by Andreas Schlitzer in my lab, uh, which he did during his PhD thesis. And actually, he discovered a new precursor cell type, which is the direct precursor of plasma cytodendritic cells in murine bone marrow. And to uh, introduce to you this um, second part, I would like to uh, speak about dendritic cell development and the precursors involved there. Um, DC dendritic cells uh, are thought to develop from the common myeloid uh, progenitor via the macrophage dendritic cell progenitor, which gives rise to a common dendritic cell progenitor called CDP. This um, actually then gives rise to an immediary, intermediary state, the pre-conventional dendritic cell, which is able to leave the bone marrow, circulate and seed the tissues, and there further differentiate into conventional dendritic cell subsets, such as the CD8 alpha positive and CD11 B positive populations. Uh, there's another pathway to generate dendritic cells via monocytes directly from the MDP progenitor. And monocytes also circulate and especially during inflammation are recruited to the tissues where they can become macrophages or inflammatory conventional dendritic cells. So this is a, a totally different and separate pathway. For plasma cytoid dendritic cells, it was shown that they are, can also be derived from the common DC progenitor but it was thought that they actually finally differentiate in the bone marrow, then exit and seed the tissues. And it was not known if there is an equivalent of the pre-conventional DC also for the PDC lineage. Um, this uh, dendritic cell development is regulated by growth factors, especially FLT3 ligand is an essential growth factor for DCs for all subtypes. Um, for the monocyte pathway, for macrophage differentiation, MCSF is important, and for inflammatory DC differentiation, GMCSF uh, is an important growth factor. These different consecutive steps are regulated by transcription factors. Early on, Pu1 plays an important role. Then for the plasma cytoid dendritic cell lineage, E22 is the uh, most critical transcription factor, and also other transcription factors such as SPI-B or IRF-8, which are actually targets of E22. For the conventional DC lineage, um, BATF-3 appears to be critical for CD8-positive CDC development, whereas other factors are involved in CD11-B-positive DC development. And for the monocyte uh, inflammatory DC um, pathway, it's not really known which transcription factor is critical. <clears throat> so what we found is that in murine bone marrow, where actually there are many PDCs, almost 3% of all leukocytes, we can differentiate two populations. One larger population, making up two-thirds, expresses the chemokine receptor CCR9, and in the smaller population, 30% uh, uh, expresses very low levels of this receptor or lacks CCR9. We further characterized these two populations, and we found they are quite similar in the expression of B220 cyclic H as a PDC-specific molecule, but they do differ in the expression of MHC class 2, which is much lower on the CCNI negative population, and also uh, on some other markers, such as CX3CR1, which is higher on the CCNI negative. Um, and overall, looking at the phenotypic pattern, we can say that these cells appear to be less differentiated than the CCN9 positive. And this is also confirmed by morphology, where actually CCN9 positive PDCs look like PDCs should, plasma cell-like morphology, round cell type. And the CCN9 negative are larger, they are more irregular, they more resemble uh, dendritic cell precursors. Um, we also functionally analyzed these two populations and found that they can both produce interferon alpha upon CPG stimulation. And the CCN9 negative population is even more potent in producing interferon alpha. So in that regard, they, they appear to be already uh, plasma cyto DC. 
And they also express the transcription factor E22, which I had mentioned to be important for the PDC lineage, although at slightly lower levels. We then um, did uh, gene array analysis and compared the two populations and found that many of the PDC signature genes, including the transcription factor E22, which is TCF4, and its targets, such as SPI-B, are expressed on both populations. But there were also differentially expressed genes. And when looking at these, we found that <coughs> the CCNI negative cells express many genes which are found in common dendritic cell progenitors, whereas the CCNI positive cells express on a higher level plasma cytoid specific uh, dendritic cell specific genes. So these are genes which are found also on splenic and peripheral plasma cytoid disease, confirming that our hypothesis that these cells are actually, the CCNI negative are actually uh, dendritic cell progenitor cells rather than differentiated PDCs. Um, we find these CCNI negative PDC-like precursors in um, bone marrow and liver at the high percentage, but also in all other organs. So in spleen, lymph node, pious patches, lung, also in the blood, in the small intestine, and very few in the colon uh, lamina propria. And interestingly, the percentage of total PDCs is also the highest in bone marrow and in liver. <clears throat> to um, analyze the in vivo fate of these uh, new precursor cells, we labeled them using a violet dye and injected both either CC9 positive or CC9 negative PDC sorted from bone marrow, and then looked at these cells after two days. We found them in bone marrow, spleen, lymph node, in all the organs, and uh, we did not find great differences in the recruitment of these cells. Only f uh, in lung and colon, it seems that the uh, CCNI negative PTC-like precursors are preferentially recruited. Now, looking at the expression of BS of PDC-specific markers, such as the BST2 molecule, we found interesting differences. So in bone marrow and liver, um, both CCNI negative and CCNI positive uh, PDCs stayed PDCs, so they kept their PDC phenotype. However, in spleen, lymph nodes, and pious patches, and also in lung and small intestine, we found a reduction in the expression of BST2, which correlated with upregulation of markers resembling um, a CDC phenotype. And this is shown here. Uh, as an example, I show the data for lymph node. When you gate on the cells which maintain the PDC markers, you see they also maintain uh, cyclic age and the lower MHC class two expression. They also are still CD11 below and CCR9 is still expressed. In the population which has downregulated BST2 at this time point, Cyclic H is lost, MHC class 2 is upregulated, and CV11B is upregulated, and CCN9 is downregulated. Um, thus, these cells resemble uh, conventional dendritic cells at this early time point. And it seems that bone marrow and liver support plasma cytoid DC uh, phenotype and differentiation, whereas other organs rather support conventional DC differentiation of this precursor. To analyze this at a later time point, we now injected CCNI negative PDC-like precursors from CD45.2 mice and injected them into CD45.1 recipients. And seven days later, prepared the tissues and analyzed uh, these cells, <coughs> what became of them. And you can see here that there's a um, great difference in their uh, developmental fate um, depending on where they actually go, into which tissue. So in the bone marrow, when they go back to bone marrow, they almost all become plasma cytoid DCs and only very few assume a, a CDC phenotype. In the liver, the picture is similar. However, in spleen and also in the mucosal tissue, such as lung, we have um, almost 80 to 90% conventional dendritic cells uh, developing from these precursors, which were initially uh, close to PDCs. And you can see here the subset distribution within the conventional DCs which are generated, and there are all the subtypes found in the spleen. <coughs> so the final differentiation of these precursors depends on the tissue-specific factors, 
which we at the moment uh, do not know what these are. Um, to, we found that in the intestine, which of course is an interesting organ uh, to look um, at the DC compartment, we found so few of these precursors that we could not really analyze them in the steady state. So what we did to um, um, improve that is to induce inflammation by transferring um, CD4, CD60 to L positive T cells into RAG1 knockout mice. This leads to a um, colitis development and you can see here the loss of body weight after uh, 13 days up to 21 days and the uh, inflammation in the colon. So in these mice we injected again our um, CCR9 positive and negative um, PDCs at day 14 and then analyzed their phenotype after two days and we found that we can uh, now analyze these cells because they are recruited to the colon and uh, even during active colitis that CC9 positive PDCs stay PDCs whereas the CC9 negative start to downregulate plasma cyto DC markers and uh, we will follow up with studies looking more closely at these cells. Um, we suspected that uh, the tissues produce factors which drive differentiation of um, PDCs and also the deviation to the conventional uh, dendritic cell lineage. And to investigate this further, we uh, went to in vitro studies and looked at the influence of a supernatant generated by intestinal epithelial cells. And you can see down here what happens when you expose CCNA negative PDC-like precursors to this supernatant they actually downregulate BST2, upregulate CD11B, and MHC class 2. This does not happen when you use the finally differentiated PDCs. And we found similar results when we incubated the cells with recombinant GMCSF. So also there you find a significant downregulation of PDC markers and um, the acquisition of a CDC-like phenotype. So GMCSF appears to be one of the factors uh, which is important here, and we found that it's also constitutively produced by intestinal epithelial cells. Uh, using the in vitro system, we could also study the function of the cells we generate from these precursors, and actually we found that they are quite efficient in inducing CD8 T cell proliferation and in from gamma production, so actually in cross-presenting antigens. They're more efficient than uh, PDCs, and then CD8 alpha negative DC is but a bit less um, efficient than the CD8 alpha positive DC isolated from spleen, which was expected. Um, we could also then look at the expression of transcription factors to understand better how this um, deviation from the PDC lineage is regulated. And we found that um, um, CDC-like cells generated from PDC-like precursors downregulate E22 and also IRF8 and uh, SPI-B, whereas they upregulated ID2, BUTF3, and PU1. ID2 is a repressor of E22, so we think that this shift in expression of transcription factors might actually be regulating this um, differentiation to CDCs. So to summarize this part of my data, we can now fill the gap and um, propose that there is actually a direct precursor of PDCs in the bone marrow, which can exit, circulate, and go to the tissues. However, this precursor is not fixed to go to the PDC lineage, to, to go to final differentiation of PDCs, but can still deviate to generate PDC, uh, conventional dendritic cells, and this decision depends on tissue-specific factors, and it also occurs uh, in a steady state that both types of cells can be generated. It seems that this is regulated by the ratio of transcription factors E22 and ID2. And um, what we don't know is what are the, the um, progenitors of these cells? Are they derived from, we know that they can be derived from the CDP, but they might also be derived from other pro earlier progenitors. And uh, we don't know exactly how, which tissue-specific factors play a role here in addition to GMCSF. So this is my group in Munich, and I would like to thank especially Andreas Schlitzer and Jakob Loschko for the work uh, I've presented today and all the other members of the group. 
And I would also like to acknowledge uh, collaborators, Matthias Schiemann, who has done the cell sorting for us, uh, which is vital for our studies. Then Silvia Heink and Thomas Korn from the neurology department who have done the EAE experiments in collaboration. And then all the other um, collaborators who have contributed reagents and mice to our studies. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to discuss uh, the work with you. Thank you.